Okay, wonderful to see you today, and uh, I do appreciate that uh, introduction very, very much, Brad. And uh, do thank you for being here. I do love pastors and ministry leaders, and we're all in this together. Whether you're just getting started or you've been at it as I have a long time, uh, we are together in Christ. And uh, the work of Christ is the greatest work on earth. You know, I say the ministry is the world's worst profession. You know, if, if, if you're looking for a profession, this, this is not it, but it's the highest call as far as I am concerned. And so very grateful to join you in this room today and, and to celebrate. Vicki, thank you so very much. Uh, you clearly have a heart for Christ that flows in your, your words and music. And uh, God inhabits the praises of his people and thanks to you and your praise to God. Uh, his presence is here. Uh, and dear to us. I know I listened to a lot of worship during, uh, especially those heavy days of the pandemic when we were isolated and insulated and all the rest. And uh, we're all so encouraged by those who lead us in worship and I'm grateful so much. So thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes. And, and then John and Kathy, it's good to see you. Normally, uh, you know, well, actually, I was in studio with you two or three years ago, and then back on. Great interviewer, you know. I'll, I'll, I'll interview with these folks anytime. Comedians, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> no, good effort though. Good, good, good try. Uh, and, and, and since you were telling those stories, uh, you know, I have one. I'll make you look good with this one. All right, I'm gonna make you look good with this one. Uh, and since you were talking about Ruth earlier, uh, so uh, what was Boaz like before he met Ruth? Ruthless, that's right. Okay. Yeah, I like that too. Tell your kids and your grandkids. I do appreciate this station, the Word at them, and. Uh, all of our Salem stations, we've had the privilege of uh, associating with Salem and the various outlets uh, across the nation uh, for a number of years now, at least 25. PowerPoint is our radio and television ministry. And um, I love radio because it's portable, it's transferable, and it, you can go with it anywhere. And I'm uh, just talking to Brad, great guy, uh, who was talking about just the impact still, even though it's an older medium uh, of uh, technology, of course, is still very powerful and very strong. I can tell you it just happened to me uh, uh, Sunday evening. Uh, you know, the Cowboys were playing the Patriots. And uh, so the Cowboys uh, were in a tight game, ends up in overtime, and, you know, it happens sometimes, pastors. Then I'm, you know, expected at a deacon's banquet. And the Cowboys are in overtime. So what do you do? I get in my car. I'm driving as fast as I can to the church with them. And I, and I turn on the radio to get the end of the game. And you know what? I think it was more exciting listening to it on the radio than watching it, the way the announcers are able to communicate so effectively. I'm a big baseball fan. John and Kathy are always on me about my beloved Texas Rangers who aren't doing that well, but we'll, we'll be back someday. Uh, maybe in the next millennium, I'm not sure, but um, be that as it may, uh, you know, radio baseball announcers are also great. I, I grew up listening to Harry Carey uh, do the St. Louis Cardinals. So my point is radio is a dynamic way to communicate and especially uh, to communicate the gospel of Christ and teach God's word. The other fact that we're on Monday through Friday, at least our program is, and so we're there every day. You know, we, we do television as well. Uh, and we're grateful for that. Of course, we have online. Uh, now it's exploded during uh, the, the COVID pandemic. Our, our online opportunities have increased, and so have yours. But uh, radio still, because it's just there, it's, it's daily and your presence. I think we're on here at 2 o'clock and then 9.30 Monday through Friday, and we do appreciate that opportunity uh, very, very much. And uh, if you would like more information about uh, our ministry, you can go to powerpoint.org or jackgraham.org, or if you want to know more about the church or watch us online sometime, uh, go to prestonwood.org. And especially if you're ever in the Dallas Fort Worth area, uh, please come and see us. We would love to have you uh, at Prestonwood. Well, it's 
Paul didn't uh, talk about earlier, just, you know, we all know, nobody has to tell us we've been through trying and tough times the last 18 months, something that came out of nowhere, it seemed we could have never expected it, this uh, massive shift that took place. I was sitting in a restaurant in January of 2020, and a lady walked over to me uh, that I had never seen before, and I haven't seen her since. And she said, God sent me over here to bring a message. I got up to greet her. She said, no, no. Uh, she said, I'm just here for a minute. God told me to come over here and give you a message. Now, frankly, when people come up to me and say, God sent me over here to give you a message, I'm, I'm kind of doing this. But there was something about her, her countenance, her sincerity that I said, okay, go. And she said, in 90 days, there's going to be a shift. And that was it. I said, 90 days of shift, what does that mean? She said, I don't know. That's just what God told me to do. Well, 90 days was Easter of 2020. We've been in the pandemic uh, a few weeks at that time. And uh, I'm still not certain about the timing and the 90 days and all that that meant, but in one sense, I believe God gave me a bit of a heads up. I don't know who she was. Maybe she was an angel sent from the Lord. I do believe in angels. There's angels in this room. I wrote a book about angels, as a matter of fact. And uh, maybe she was a, an angel messenger. Maybe she just was a woman sensitive to the word of God. But she gave me a, a heads up, and I thought about that often. A shift is coming. And we've seen that. And we've seen it in the church, we've seen it in the culture, we've seen it uh, internationally and nationally, and frankly, we haven't known exactly what to do with it. Nobody gave us a playbook for this, right? And we've been making it up, along like Indiana Jones, where the little guy said, Dr. Jones, what do we do now? He said, I have no idea. I've been making this stuff up as we get along. And, and frankly, it, I felt like that. We were just making things up and making decisions, and we never knew if we were making good ones or are bad ones, and uh, we felt, I, I felt a little bit about this report I heard from a bricklayer who had an accident, and he turned in his uh, report, his accident uh, report, and uh, when he did, they asked him for more information because when, they, when he put down the cause of accident, he put poor preparation. So here's what he wrote. He said, Dear Sir, I'm in writing in response to your request for additional information in block three of the accident report form. I put for planning as the cause of the accident. You asked for further ex explanation, and I trust the following details will be sufficient. I'm a big bricklayer by trade. On the day of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of a new six-story building. And when I completed my work, I found I had some bricks left over, which weighed later were found to be weighing 240 pounds. Rather than carry the brakes down by hand, he said, I decided to lower them in a barrel by using a pulley which was attached to the side of the building from the sixth floor. Got it? Okay. Securing the rope at the ground level, I went up to the roof and swung the barrel out and loaded the bricks into it. Then I went down and untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the 240 pounds of bricks. You will note on the accident reporting form that my weight is 135 pounds. <laughs> Due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. <laughs> Needless to say, I proceeded at a rapid rate up the side of the building, up the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel, which was now proceeding downward at an equally impressive speed. This explains the fractured skull, the minor abrasions, and a broken collarbone, as listed in Section 3, Accident Reporting. <laughs> Slowed only slightly, I continued my rapid ascent, not stopping until the fingers of my right hand were two knuckles deep in the pulley, which I mentioned in paragraph 2 of the correspondence. Fortunately, by this time, I had regained my presence of mind and was unable to hold the rope, or was able to hold the rope, in spite of the excruciating pain I was now beginning to experience. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel 
of the bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel, now devoid of the weight of the bricks, the barrel weighed approximately 50 pounds. I refer you again to my weight of 135 pounds. As you might imagine, I began a rapid descent down the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming up. This accounts for the two fractures, an fractured ankles, broken tooth, and severe laceration on my legs and lower body. Here, my luck began to change ever so slightly. The encounter with the barrel seemed to slow me enough to lessen my injuries when I fell on the pile of bricks and fortunately only three vertebrae were cracked. I am sorry to report, however, as I lay there on the pile of bricks in pain, unable to move, and watching the empty barrel six stories above me, I again lost my composure and presence of mind and let go of the rope. <laughs> And I lay there watching the now empty barrel begin its journey back down on me. And this explains the two broken legs. I hope this explains your inquiry as to poor planning. <laughs> now, I have to say, I think we all relate to that story during COVID-19. We didn't know whether to turn loose or hold on. We now got COVID brain. Uh, whatever that's supposed to be, we lost our presence of mind, and and we don't know what to do. But God is faithful, and in Zechariah chapter four, He gives a man on a mission like you, on a mission, uh, some encouragement, and I want to give that same encouragement to you today. Uh, so if you have your uh, handheld device or maybe even a Bible with you. I actually normally preach with a big floppy Bible. I think I'll preach with a floppy Bible. Now I know some of the young guys have got these iPads on it for some reason. I guess, you know, if this is the sword of the spirit, the word of God, I guess this is a lightsaber. So uh, I, I brought my lightsaber today and in Zechariah chapter 4, uh, here is what God said to a man who was a servant, a man by the name of Zerubbabel. He had been charged with the responsibility of rebuilding the temple. And after 20 long years, he had nothing to show for it but a big hole in the ground. He was stuck. Nothing was moving forward. And no doubt, he was discouraged. And yet in verse 6 of uh, chapter 4, the word of the Lord came to Zerubbabel. And I just want to say, insert your name there, because let this be today a word of the Lord that comes to you. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mouth? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone, or the capstone, amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Now, A calling to rebuild, and that is what God is calling us to do in these days, in many ways, is to rebuild. And I've discovered along the way that rebuilding something is harder than building something to begin with. And now we are charged with the responsibility of rebuilding our congregations. Many have left, not back yet. Many are uh, maybe never coming back. Who knows? And we seem stuck. I don't know where you are in your comeback with your church or your congregation or your media, uh, your, media uh, your ministry, but it seems like there's a lot of opposition to the comeback. It seems like there's a lot of discouragement and disappointment. And here's the main thing. Fatigue. The number one thing I'm hearing from our people is I'm tired. 
Some are physically tired, others are mentally exhausted, some just spiritually weak. And we're tired. Pastors are tired. I've had a lot of pastors tell me, I'm tired, exhausted. We're hearing a lot about burnout and battle fatigue. We're even hearing that as many as one out of uh, four ministries, about 25% of ministers, pastors, may not come back when this is all said and done. Just done with ministry. That's anecdotal. I don't know what the real number is, but we know that there are a lot of preachers and teachers and leaders and pastors and shepherds who are close to say, I'm done. Maybe that's you. Maybe God brought you here today just to hear this message of encouragement. You know, we've not only had a medical health emergency in America, but a mental health crisis in America. Amen. With all the anxiety and depression and loneliness and the fatigue and all that goes with it. And so our question is, our people are asking it, we're asking it of ourselves, how do we keep going? How do we get up and keep going? How do we get going again? And uh, one question I get a lot as an older pastor now, a veteran uh, pastor, I, I, love, I love mentoring young uh, people in ministry, and one of the things that I hear again and again and again from young pastors is just looking at the future is how can I keep doing this for a lifetime? How can I keep going? I don't want to not become one of those statistics that we hear about so often, uh, men and women who are dropping out of ministry. Well, here are some answers. God spoke. And the first thing that he says is, when you are weak, I am strong. Amen. When you are weak, I am strong. That's, of course, verse 6. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God has promised again and again to you to be his strength. That when we are weak, he is strong. A supernatural strength. Holy Spirit strength. A powerful strength that comes from within. Extra strength to keep going and to overcome obstacles and disappointments when we feel like quitting. Strength when we're tired and we don't know if we can keep going. You see, he had a physical mountain right there in front of him. Apparently there was uh, there at the Temple Mount this, this huge uh, obstacle that was standing between him and uh, the assignment that he had been given just to get it done. And, and, and the big question in Jerusalem those days was, is this, is this old man Zerubbabel, is he going to get live long enough <laughs> to accomplish this task? Because there was that mountain. And mountains, of course, are representative of obstacles. And mountains, in effect, they're beautiful, but mountains can obscure our vision and obstruct our mission in ministry. And I think what's happening to a lot of us in these times is just we're, we're losing sight of our vision. Or we're, we're not seeing any longer the mission that God has called us to accomplish. We do hear a lot about normal or the new normal. When are we going to get back to normal? Well, frankly, I'm not sure we need to get back to normal. <laughs> You know, somebody said, uh, if, if your Christianity was normal, you know, the normal Christian life is spirit-filled living. And for so many people, they are so abnormal, if they started acting normal, it would seem subnormal. <laughs> well, I'm not sure we want the old normal. We want what God's going to do next. The new that's coming. That's going to be a lot better than normal. Now, here's the thing I think. If we expect this to bring our people back the way it was and just keep doing it the way we were doing it, if we think in some way that, that we can just keep doing church the way we were doing it, if it's just getting the band back together again, just getting the Christian club back together again, I think what God is saying to me in the midst of these 18 months, three words, evangelism, evangelism, evangelism. Focus on that. It doesn't mean we clearly, the 
message would be we don't care about the congregation and shepherd the sheep and lead and disciple. But we're not going to get all the church crowd back. What we need to do is to get into the highways and hedges and the lanes and the streets. I love this mission of getting the gospel to every house and every zip code in our communities. Because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take a new vision of his vision and his mission to take the gospel to the world. But he gives strength to the weary. That's what I want to tell you today. I wrote my book called Reignite. And I wanted to write about perseverance and endurance and uh, resilience. And that, that's really the impact and the, and the topic of the book. But I call this now my COVID book because um, in, in the midst of it, God prompted me because of so many facing anxiety and depression and, and uh, emotional suffering of various kinds to tell my story of an experience that I had in 2009 after a cancer surgery when I unexpectedly was thrown into a depression and anxiety. It's like a PTSD experience for me. I'd never had anything like this in my life, and it was a long six months to a year of struggling with this. And I talked about it a little bit. I shared a little bit about it, especially with closer friends and others, especially counseling. But I'd never really gone as public about it as I, I did in the last couple of years. And then so I decided to write about it. And so the first 60 pages, I, I talk about my experience with this and how we were able, by God's grace, to get through it. And uh, you can go to, uh, maybe we put up that screen, because I want everybody to get this book. It's the Reignite book, and we get, get it up, and, because I want you to see how you can get that. Well, we'll get it on the screen later, but we want to give it away to you. Just go to the, uh, uh, there it is right there. And so you see the address and write that down, and we just want you to have it as our gift to you at that code number. Because I, I believe I'm saying some things that not only Christians, but Christian leaders need to hear. It wasn't easy for me. It's not easy for most men to talk about this stuff, uh, emotional health and the shame and the stigma of it. Thank God is going away in our generation. And uh, I'm grateful for that. So I wanted to be a part of that healing as well. But I tell that story. But one of the things that happened to me on this point of when we are weak, he is strong. I came back after taking some time off, had the surgery, cancer surgery in May. Uh, you know, I was, I, was, I was so crazy. I thought, I'm going to get this surgery done. It's prostate cancer surgery. And I'll be back in the pulpit in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and so, sure enough, you know, I did the surgery. I, I really went in with confidence and, 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 and got you know, through. And I'm up preaching in 11 days. And about two, three weeks into this, I started feeling off, really off. And now I know I couldn't sleep. That, now I know what was happening to me, just the pressure, the stress. And then there were questions about whether they really got it all. And all those questions that you get, if you had cancer, you know this uh, story. And so fear, I realized later, I wasn't fighting cancer, I was fighting fear. Like I'd never experienced in my life. And so I took some time off in the summer. The church uh, gladly gave me that time off. And, and uh, came back in September, but I still wasn't ready. I was just tired. That was the thing that was amazing to me. I just couldn't get going again couldn't, you know, get strong again. And it just went on day after day and you know, night after night, sleepless night, all those things. If you've ever been in one of these things, you know what I'm talking about. And so I came back to the pulpit in September. And I was just crawling into that pulpit because I was still exhausted. I couldn't even prepare. One of the things depression and anxiety will do too, you can't concentrate very well. So preparing new sermons seemed out of question. It's hard to study. And so I thought, I'm just going to do a message series this fall on the promises of God. And I'm going to take those promises that I've been listening and leaning into over these past three or four months at that time. And I'm going to do my best just to preach on the promises of God. And I, 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 I did several of them, about 10 or 12 of them, the great promises of God, Proverbs 3, 5, and 
6. And, and one of them was Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait on the Lord will renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings as eagles, run, and not be weary to walk, and not faint. He gives strength to the weary. So I was preaching to myself. But again, I'm telling you, I was not at my best. I was in the, the least confident, the most uh, uh, exasperated, exhausted condition of my life. And I thought, well, I'm glad that's done. And you know PowerPoint took those messages. I didn't even know it at the time. They wrapped them up, put them in a series, and put them on radio. I remember I was at my worst and lowest in life. And we had the largest response on radio to, to that day that we had ever had in the history of our ministry and our program. When I was the weakest, when I was at my worst, God was at his best. And God takes our weakness. God takes our weakness. When we are weak, he is strong. So there is there is strength for you. And, and if you're you're sitting here today and you're thinking, there's no way I can keep going. There's no way I can, in my own strength, keep doing this. Well, then you're right. <laughs> But God has said, not by mind, not by power, but by my spirit. And I can tell you that you can be encouraged in the Lord. Remember when David, I remember during the pandemic, one of the sermons I preached was on David and Ziklag. Remember his army uh, was defeated uh, and, and they burned the house, took the women, burned the camp. They came back. The army was ready to kill David uh, it's because of failed leadership, they said. And, and, and so what did David do? He encouraged himself. He strengthened himself in the Lord. Sometimes there's nobody else that can do it. It's good to have counselors. It's good to have friends. Thank God for my wife who walked me through that. It's, it, it's good. But sometimes there's nobody there that can really help you but one somebody. And his name is Jesus. You can, so it's your responsibility and my responsibility pastors and church leaders to stay strong in the Lord and the power of his mind. That's on me, ultimately. I can't expect others always to hold me up and to keep pushing me forward. It's on me as the spiritual leader of our church and of our, our family to keep going, to encourage myself in the Lord. When you're weak, he is strong. He can do things in our weakness that we can't do in and of ourselves. Secondly, God gives us a stamina and a courage to keep on digging, to keep on going, because what God starts, he's promised, he will finish. Amen. Amen. That's what this passage is about. God said to Serubal, there are going to be shouts of victory, grace, grace to it, because what God has started in him, the word of the Lord came Verse 8 saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house and his hands shall complete it. God gave that man a promise. And that promise is what I start. I will finish. God gave you a dream. God put a desire in your heart to pastor, to serve, to lead, to minister. The devil's trying to take it away from you. Disappointment's trying to take you down. But God said, hold on to my promise. What I started in you, I'm going to finish. Philippians 1, 6, he who began the good work in you will perfect it, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I was on the plane yesterday coming up here, and, and I was sitting uh, with, we were up with Mass, so I didn't even recognize him at first, you know. But there was one of our members sitting right next to me. And, and so he, you know, recognized me. I said, oh, that's you. And yes, that's you. And uh, we talked a little bit, and, and then we both, you know, went about our business, reading, whatever. But when we got off the plane, he said something to me that I really needed because it was Monday. You know how Mondays are, right? So there, I actually like Mondays. It feels like a new beginning, but some days Mondays are tough. But this was a 
this was a tough one just coming off of a Sunday with a little bit of disappointment. You know, somebody asked me, Pastor, do you take off your day off on Mondays? I said, no, I don't. I don't want to feel that bad on my own time. <laughs> So I was just kind of complaining to myself and the Lord because we had gotten the numbers from the services and we were down again. We'd been climbing and now we're in a low and come back again. And you know how it is and, and, and you've been doing the same thing. Some of your churches are just barely getting back. And, and so we look at the numbers and you know look at the data stat that and, and, and it's not all that great. I mean, doing, we're doing fine, but I, it was just one of those days. That I thought, Lord, how long do we have to keep doing this? I mean, this when are we coming back? When is this really going to be back? And of course, no one knows. But that was the kind of talk I was having with myself. All that negativity kind of creeping in. And so I got off the plane, and our, men, our, our uh, member walked up to me afterwards as we were leaving and said, Hey, I want to give you a couple of scriptures. God prompted me to tell you. And he gave me Philippians 1 6. But God has started, he will finish. And don't be weary, Galatians 6. He said, don't be weary and well doing, for in due time you will reap if you do not have yes. Now don't tell me God didn't put that man next to me in the plan to give me that word. Yes. God always gives us the word when we need it the most. Yes. And so I'm just passing that along to you today. Yes. But God starts, he's going to finish. Yes. And you don't have to worry about that. Because God's got it. Amen. God has not changed his mind about you or your calling. You have a history with the Lord, right? He's always been faithful. Amen. And your calling for God from God is, is a permanent calling. It's a clear calling. It may get rerouted from time to time. But we're on our way in the will of God. And that calling is sure in your life. Make sure your calling is clear and sure. A lot of times in the pastorate, in the ministry, that it's the calling, it's the only thing that keeps us going. Knowing that God has called us. Um, I remember when I was first called to preach, and I do believe, I'm old school, I believe biblical, in the call of God. And I was a young man, about 15, and, and, and I was just sensing that God was calling. I really think God put it in my heart as a child uh, to preach the gospel, but you know, I was really sensing it when I was 15, sophomore in high school. I was a baseball player, loved baseball, went on to play college ball. I couldn't have gone to college apart from baseball, provided a, a way that I could go to college and play baseball, which was a great thing. But I, we, we were having a big softball game at camp. My pastor selected me to be on his team because, frankly, I was really, really good. And uh, so we were, we were getting ready to play for the championship, and I, I, I had been moved in the service, and, and, and uh, the, the 11 o'clock uh, service at camp, and it was so you know, strong that I, did, I even skipped lunch for a teenage boy. That was something. I went to the prayer garden, and I, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, I was just, you know, it was all over, man. I'm just praying, Lord, I want to do your will. I want to, I want to, if you're calling me to preach, Lord, I, you, know, you better hold me back because I'm ready to go. And those kinds of prayers. And I thought if I could just talk to my pastor, Fred Swank was his name, Brother Swank, we called him. I could just talk to him. I need to ask him. So I left and we had this ball game at 2 o'clock and I see Brother Swank walking across the outfield. Now he had picked the team. He was the pitcher on our team and he was focused on this ball game. And I could tell he had his glove on. He was go to go. And, but, I, you know, I was brave enough. I went up to him and said, Brother Swank, man, can I ask you a question? Go, what is it, son? What, 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 what is it? I can tell you I was aggravating him. <laughs> what is it? And I said, well, I really believe God may be calling me to preach, and I'm, I'm trying to, I've been in the prayer garden. I've been praying about this. I really think God may. He said, okay, son, that's fine, that's fine. He said, but now look. He said, if God's calling you to preach, he's going to be calling you after this ball game. Let's go play ball. <laughs> It ticked me off, to be honest with you. What kind of pastor tells you that? A pastor who was right, actually. 
Because the call of God, before and after, is always there. And I'm just so grateful for that call that keeps me in. But one last thing. Little is much when God is in it. That's what that verse is about when it says, Who is despised the day of small? Just getting the start. Now, when God moves, he moves so often suddenly and spectacularly. Um, that's why it says here, before it's a removal, you shall become a plain with shouts of grace, grace to it, capstone's going to be built, things going to be done, it's going to be accomplished. This is my promise. And that little phrase in there, before it's a removal, the mountain shall become as a plain. Actually, just one word in the Hebrew. And I'm going I'm to impress you with my Hebrew right now. All right? It's just one word, shall become a, as a plain. And you know what that Hebrew word is? Before Zerubbabel. Whammo! <laughs> that's a loose translation of the language. But it's really just one word, which, I mean, it means like those nuclear. It explodes. And the mountain that was standing there obscuring the vision and obstructing the mission is gone. God moved. And so that's when he reminds us all then. So don't despise the day of small things. Whammo. Whammo the Christ. Because in your time and in God's time, the victory is on the way. With shouts of grace to it. Amen. We won't get the glory. God gets the glory. Amen. It's all of His grace. And I just show that every as much when God is in it because the most important places in our life is in the secret place and the small place. And God often tests us there and prepares us for the greater victories. And I do believe what we need to, instead of worrying about how many are back and so few are back, let's don't focus on what's lost. Let's focus on what is left and what is yet to be done and to rebuild. And don't despise the small things. God, in his own time and his own way, is going to rebuild. And you're going to be stronger and greater and bigger in your calling and ministry than ever before. And I just really declare that over you today. Imagine a new beginning. Good work. You have more than enough, more than you need. It may be small. It may not be much yet. But God is in it. A little as much when God is in it. God uses small things like small stones in David's hand and wanted a slingshot to take down a giant. Or loaves and fish, a little lad's lunch to feed a multitude. Or flask of perfume. As Mary and Bethany broke the small little thing, just a, just a bottle of perfume. While others criticized her, Jesus commended her. Said she has done what she could. She brought what she could. And he said, and so what she's done is going to be spoken of as a memorial throughout all generations to me and to her and her faithfulness. We're still talking about that today, just as Jesus said. Just a small act by a little lady in a, in, a, in a little town, Bethany, outside of Jerusalem, who did such a little thing. But we're still smelling the sweet aroma of her sacrifice and what she did for Jesus. So, get your fire back. Reignite. Paul says, stir up the gift that is in you. Because it says here, the eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro. He knows where you are. He hasn't forgotten about you. He hasn't forgotten about your calling or your mission. And when you are weak, He is strong. And what God starts, He finishes. And little is much, God is in it. Amen. 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 Amen.